perfect, perfect. So first we're going to introduce Cheryl Stevens. Cheryl is the VP of Client Success here at Hippotrek, and she is also um, an expert on FQHCs um, and perfect, rural perfect. health clinics. So oh first my. we're going to introduce Cheryl Stevens. Cheryl is the... There we go, look at that. We know we're live when we start to hear the echo. All right, so Cheryl again, the moderator. Then we have Dina Castricone. Um, here we go, y'all. I was trying so hard to be like super professional with this and we're just gonna have to end up being myself. Okay. So Dina is a privacy and healthcare attorney with over 18 years of legal experience prior to opening her own practice. Dina served as the general counsel and chief privacy, uh, chief of privacy at one of the largest FQHCs in the country. Before her in-house role, Dina was a partner at the New England Regional Law Firm, where she served as the chair of privacy and cybersecurity group and was a member of the healthcare group. She began her career as a law clerk to the chief justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court, and she has substantial experience navigating privacy challenges in healthcare and counsel and counsel. Blah, 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 blah. Oh my goodness, y'all! It's not like we're live or anything. Um, and counsels clients on compliance with privacy laws. Dina also advises healthcare providers and provides on a broad range of regulatory compliance, risk management, licensure, reimbursement, contract, and day-to-day -day operational issues. So thank you so much, Dina. We also have Aaron McLean. Aaron is an attorney at the law firm of Freeman and McLean PC and a consultant for and president and CEO of Compliance Stride, a company specializing in healthcare compliance and organizational consulting. Aaron is licensed to practice law in Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, and Colorado, and holds a healthcare compliance CHC um, and healthcare privacy compliance CHPC certification. She frequently gives presentations on healthcare law and compliance matters and has published a number of recent articles on top topics ranging from HIPAA to telehealth. And both of these ladies have been on our podcast, Armchair HIPAA. So you should definitely take a chance to look at them. So without further ado, I am going to go off camera and mute myself so you guys don't have to hear me messing up anymore and let these two wonderful women take it from here. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, and thanks to Hippotrek for sponsoring today's, uh, for hosting today's webinar. Erin, Cheryl, and I are really excited to be talking about this topic today. Um, you know, I like to think of this topic as the evolution of our understanding of treatment disclosures under HIPAA. And as you all know, HIPAA permits a healthcare provider to share patient information for treatment purposes without an authorization, without a written authorization from the patient. And generally, we have understood this to mean that a healthcare, that a healthcare provider can share patient information with a patient's other medical providers. So while there's been no significant changes to the definition of treatment under HIPAA, there have been two key developments, uh, recent developments that are really going to change the way providers understand and approach treatment disclosures under HIPAA. And we're gonna talk about those two key developments today. And the first involves a, a new rule outside of HIPAA the information blocking rule. And Erin is going to walk us through how that information blocking rule impacts disclosures from one treating provider to another under HIPAA. Um, and that discussion is going to be limited just to how the information blocking rule affects uh, treatment disclosures under HIPAA because we simply don't have enough time to do an exhaustive discussion on the information blocking rule today. The second key development came in the form of some guidance from OCR or the Office for Civil Rights, the entity that enforces HIPAA. And they issued some guidance in their notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, which we'll give you some more um, information on, where they explained that it's proper to share protected health information with third parties that aren't healthcare providers. And so later I'll walk through that guidance with you and help understand when it's okay to share protected health information with organizations like social service agencies or community-based um, providers without needing a 
patient's written authorization. Um, Aaron Cheryl and I will also talk about best practices under both topics. And we've got, as Sarah mentioned, two sample policies that we'll go through. And we're also going to talk, to talk about oh, I have several those. examples. Uh, we'll <laughs> talk about several examples involving COVID-19 related information, as well as just mm -hmm. some other examples. I just, uh, um, the Zoom um, webinar on um, updates. I think we've got somebody who needs industry. to mute their their line. Can we? Mm -hmm. Who? Mm -hmm. Nobody came here to talk to me. Oh. As I was at the bathroom. Sarah, do you have the ability to mute lines? Cheryl does. And Zeta, can you please put yourself on mute, please? I'm so sorry. You're okay. It's happened to us all. Um, so Aaron's going to kick us off with providing a little more background information that gives us more context to understand where we are, how we got to where we are today. So I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. Thanks, Dina. Well, that's a long discussion of how we are, where we got, <laughs> how we got to where we are today. Thanks everybody for being here. We are going to talk mainly about the course of the last year and, and um, what we saw. I know Dina and I have been really excited about this program because we can see the ONC and CMS really bringing together the oper interoperability pieces that are gonna match up with each other eventually. And this all started, of course, back with the High Tech Act and even before that with HIPAA, really trying to figure out how do we get information shared amongst providers in order to have treatment more efficient? How do we get things more interoperable? And that's really how we ended up here. What, like Dina said, what's great is we're starting to get some final rules out and even some proposed rules. The proposed rules, notice of proposed rulemaking that came out in December, like Dina was saying, really gave us some guidance on how to um, deal with information um, exchange for treatment purposes. And even in the space of uh, non-providers um, and treatment related activities. Um, so, and so we decided let's, let's put it all together. Let's talk about treatment providers with treatment providers and treatment providers with non-treatment providers and care coordination and case management. And that's where we're really gonna focus today. If you would like more information on uh, where we, how we got here for information blocking, there is a Compliance Today article that I wrote that was published in June of 2020 called 21st Century Cures Act, Avoiding Information Blocking for Treatment Purposes. And so we're not gonna go into too much of that today. You can look that up and, and find it. But what did happen in this last year is on March 9th, we don't have that date here, but on March 9th, both the ONC and CMS uh, uh, they finalized rules on interoperability that really pointed towards one another. And then on May 1st of 2020, those rules were published in the Federal Register. What was going on, of course, at the time is the lockdown and COVID. And really, I think a lot of these rules floated under the radar and a lot of people didn't even know they existed, Dina. So I'm really excited we're here because we can talk about that. And um, originally, the, the, you were supposed to start complying with the information blocking rule in November, November 2nd. And then, of course, um, the ONC came out and said, we're going to, HHS came out and said, we're going to extend that uh, date for compliance to April 5th. So you keep seeing that April 5th date, and that's the extended date of compliance that um, was put in place in order to help us get out of COVID so we can refocus on, on these rules. And if we go back to um, really how we got here, um, in 2015, the, the Cures Act um, was passed by Congress, and it was addressing um, some issues with interoperability and moving to the space where we were sharing information. And one of those things that came out in the reports to Congress was this term information blocking. And it really just related to, and, and um, the the back then the definition for information blocking was uh, knowingly and unreasonably interfering with the exchange or use of electronic health information so that that's really an easy simple understanding of what that means and so what we have here um, are you know are these 
rules that are going to make it so that we exchange information interoperably for treatment purposes with other healthcare providers in a, excuse me, in a manner that does not um, inhibit treatment. And then Dina will talk about the treatment related provisions that came out of the December 2020 uh, um, H, uh, CMS um, and OCR um, discussion related to HIPAA. So if we go to the next slide. We're gonna talk just right now about sharing with treatment providers after the information blocking rule passage. And what we want you to know is that generally speaking, we're talking about uh, electronic health information. Originally, we thought um, that the information blocking rule may apply to paper information. We still may see that um, if you hold paper or if you hold information electronically and a provider needs uh, the information in a paper form, that you know could implicate inf information blocking if you're not getting the information over to another provider. Um, it doesn't change HIPAA, but what it does in the ONC rule is say, if a permitted disclosure um, exists for treatment purposes and a request is made for that information that is permitted and you choose not to provide that information to the requesting provider, then you could be information blocking. So really we're addressing the permitted disclosures um, under HIPAA. And we did provide a definition here. It's a pretty long definition. If you go to healthit.gov, then you can actually see more information about information blocking if you search the site there. But we did want you to provide, we, we wanted you to have this information. We wanted to provide it to you so that you could see that if you know an action is likely to interfere with the um, access or exchange of this information by other healthcare providers, and you take steps that really does interfere um, or prevent another treatment provider from accessing information, you're likely going to be information blocking. And so we need to talk about how our policies um, allow for the permitted disclosure of information to treatment providers. And that's really what we're going to be talking about here today. And, and the question is, are you information blocking? And uh, the answer is, let's take a look at your policies. So are there spaces in which your entity um, has made a policy of refusing healthcare providers um, with information requested for treatment purposes um, if there's not an authorization from a patient? Or um, have you delayed your response to a treatment provider's request for information in order to keep them out of the market economically? Or um, have you just um, uh, done so in a manner that is beyond the amount of days permitted by um, uh, HIPAA in that space? So really there could be a lot of places where you're potentially information blocking and it's really going back to what your practices are. And, uh, and, and, and knowing that we don't need an authorization from a patient in order to provide information to other treatment providers for treatment purposes. And if you require that, which I know a lot of providers have required that in the past, that could constitute information blocking. What we do want to note, and this is a space that you might want to explore deeper than we're going to be able to do today, is that uh, there are some exceptions to the information blocking provisions. Of course, we all love the exceptions, don't we? You know, we think we know a rule and then there's exceptions. But these exceptions really do match up with HIPAA. And, you know, Deanna, you and I have talked about this. If you go back to the basics of HIPAA in uh, these exceptions, 
they match up and they even match up with the the notice of proposed rulemaking that we saw in December. So, you know, it, it matches up with the fees exceptions, it matches up with the security exceptions, with the privacy exceptions um, or, or requirements, I should say, uh, under HIPAA. So what they did in, in these exceptions is say there are spaces where you may not be able to uh, provide information in the manner requested by another provider because of these issues that we've seen addressed under HIPAA. So we're going to allow for those exceptions. But again, they're very narrow and providers won't be able to use them to engage in information blocking. So there's got to be, of course, documentation around the exceptions if you don't provide information. And there needs to be a clear example that you're utilizing one of these exceptions in order to ensure that there's privacy, security, or appropriateness in the way that you disclose the information to other providers. So take a look at this. I think th they can these descriptions over at healthit.gov can be very helpful in your figuring out what to do with your policies and procedures related to the information blocking rule and the exceptions. Hi, Dina, this is Cheryl. I have a couple of questions. Great. I well, thought I, I thought I'd take the opportunity to inject them here. So uh, if possible, this is the comment. If possible, I'd like to hear a comment on, a policy, on if a policy is advised when using voluntarily disclosed geocoding information from patients to help with care coordination. Right, and are we talking, I don't know if we're talking with other treatment providers or we're talking with non-treatment providers for treatment related services. I think, Cheryl, do you mind if we wait for that one till the end, till Absolutely. we cover everything? Okay, and yep. maybe we get some clarity on that question. Do you have another one? Yes, I do. Okay. How does information blocking apply to discharge from inpatient settings when 42 CFR part two is in effect? And another good question, we are going to talk a little bit about 42 CFR part two. Um, what we need to remember, and I think Dina's going to talk a little bit more about this later, is um, whether we have the patient consent. And that's the type of consent that's required under 42 CFR part two. And what is the scope of consent? So, um, you know, I, I, I think that part two is, is very clear. Um, and then over the course of the last couple of years, it's been even made more clear by SAMHSA as to what consents need to contain and what you can do with those consents depending on the scope. So um, I think this is a great question. And of course, uh, part two relates to drug and alcohol treatment re related uh, uh, documentation and, and patient information. So we would just be really focused there on the consent forms. And I have one last one. Can a covered entity make an information blocking claim against a covered entity? For example, if a social services agency asks for healthcare data and the covered entity declines. Yes, you can. And you can make that complaint to ONC. Uh, we don't know now, now at this point what the penalties are going to be likely coming out of OCR. So we're looking actually for a final rule from OCR on what those penalties are eventually going to be. Uh, but at this time, starting in April 5th or after April 5th, yes, that can happen. And again, we're, that's a, a, another open question is, what is that enforcement going to look like and what are those penalties going to look like? So what's good about right now is we're looking at this, we're getting our policies and procedures in place, we're making sure that we're not doing it. So if somebody does make a complaint against us, when that is that complaint is looked at, we're in much better shape than down the road when they start telling us more about sort of penalties we're going to be facing. And just to clarify that the question was from I, what, can a non-covered entity make the information blocking claim against a covered entity? Just to make uh, sure. That yes. So the way that the Cures Act work is there's there's not a covered entity, non-covered entity right. 
uh, description in the Cures Act, really it, they're talking about treatment providers. And so the scope of treatment providers under um, the ONC's rule is a lot broader than covered entities. So um, right. a treatment provider could be, uh, you know, social services agency potentially could be a counselor, could be a chiropractor, could be any other type of treatment provider. So what we need to remember is we're not talking just about covered entities here, even though this does relate to HIPAA, we're talking about all treatment providers in the treatment providing space. Thanks. And, and complaints can come from anywhere. So, and, and we just don't know, of course, what the, the ONC and the OCR are gonna do with them, but anyone can make a complaint. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so where are we now? So for, again, so we're talking about sharing information with other treatment providers for treatment purposes. I think the question that just was brought to us really tells us more um, in practicality what that means. But again, remember, we're talking about permissive disclosures for treatment purposes that used to be permissive. We used to be able to say whether or not we felt comfortable providing that information to other treatment providers, depending on the request and depending on what we thought we knew. As we move into this space of April 5th and after that, we really are gonna need to take care that we are sharing that information so that the other treatment providers receive it. I saw something on LinkedIn the other day, it was a comment about how we're, we can get uh, photos from the rover on Mars within minutes, but we can't get health information from treatment providers across the street to save our lives, right, at this point. So, um, you know, we thought that was gonna happen a lot quicker in 2009 when the High Tech Act was passed, and it just hasn't. And I know that ONC and CMS are just very serious about making sure that we bring this all together and treatment providers are able to get timely information from one another. Karen, it looked like we had a question from someone who, who wanted us to better explain why, why was it permissive and why is it now required? And so maybe a little more clarification on the fact that under HIPAA, you're not required to make a disclosure for treatment purposes. Instead, HIPAA allows you permits you to make that disclosure without, without getting the patient's written authorization. It's a permissive disclosure. But what Aaron is saying is that under these information blocking rules, when we're talking about electronic health information as of April 5th, if a treating provider requests that information, you must turn it over. And so it essentially turns that HIPAA's, you know, HIPAA's permissive stance into a required stance when we're talking about electronic health information. So if that's not helpful or you want more information, please you know, chime in on the chat again. Sorry, Erin. No, that's great, Dina. Thank you for that clarification. And this is really good for us to know, you know where people stand in their understanding of both HIPAA and the ONC requirements as they merge together. So, so Cheryl, I know you worked in uh, 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 for a long time in both the health information exchange space and the FQHC space and with other rural providers, where do you see this going and what have you seen that you think makes this, uh, you know, needed? Well, for years, um, when we were requesting information on a patient, um, it, it was very commonly um, said to me, well, we can't do that, HIPAA won't let us. And if you're not a doctor that, you know, that can sometimes, they can get away with that. So I think when, when we're looking at this, we, we need to remember um, that this is necessary. And remember that these requests and responses should be viewed with your patient's care in mind, not with trying to get out of doing work, which was what we always felt like when somebody said, well, I can't do that. We just assumed they didn't want to take the time to do it. Maybe not fairly, but that's certainly how it felt. Right. Um, I, think, I think the other thing that in, in mind with that is that's why we need to respond promptly because that patient is in treatment now. We don't want them getting the data that the doctor is asking for 30 days after they've had their appointment or before the next um, appointment is when they really need to be seeing the data from us and, what, and learn from us and how the treatment is going. 
Um, I, I, the other thing I think, because most of this is gonna be applicable to electronic, everybody's had time to get uh, uh, an electronic version of a uh, medical record in place. Not everybody, but a majority of people. So it's not going to be the same concern that it was um, in the past. If you ask for it electronically, you should probably get it electronically and it, it easily. Um, the other, um, while you talked about that they're gonna be effective um, April 5th, I think uh, if people have an extended um, process to change policies, they ought to get started on it now because we're, we're coming up to a, uh, a month right. <laughs> before this is effective. I also, know that, yeah, so go ahead. Ahead. sorry. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I know you spoke previously to me about just remembering that the reason that we're here treating patients is so that they can get treated and get better. And if we don't have the information about them as a treatment provider from other treatment providers, we can't do that. Right. And that's right. key exactly. here. I, I, I have a, a question jump up from Christina. So after April 5th, we do not need a signed medical release from a patient to send records to another provider. So just so you know, Christina, you don't need that now. Um, you've never needed that sort of authorization. Again, the treatment uh, exception to the authorization rule has been around for a very long time. And so it's a permissive disclosure that doesn't require an authorization and hasn't. So what will happen in April is if you're requiring them when you don't need to require them and it's delaying treatment, it could be considered information blocking. The other, the other caveat I want to add to that, Erin, is that you still need to check with your states because uh, I don't know how quickly they're going to adapt to the CARES Act. Um, I, I'm familiar with some states that required patient signature, no matter whether it was treatment or not. Right. Yeah, Cheryl brings up a good point, not only for state laws, so there may be for example, mental health laws or, or even substance use disorder treatment laws that are different uh, that are more restrictive than HIPAA that requires something. So you may need it under those laws. I understand that the information blocking rule isn't changing consent or authorization requirements. It is simply, in this particular aspect we're talking about, is simply saying that the permissive disclosure for treatment purposes, which never, as Aaron said, never required a written authorization, is now, uh, will now be required for electronic information. Right, and I know we'll have other questions come up, Dina. What I'd like to do um, is, well, Cheryl, thank you, by the way, yes. for yes. your best practices discussion. And Dina, I'd like to pass it to you so you can go through um, our other topic that we're talking about of sharing information with non-treatment providers. Um, and then we'll come back around to some of these questions. All right, so you'll cover your policy. Well, Did you wanna I just? Yeah, and you know, let's, well, we can talk about the policy later. What this policy does that we're going to provide to everyone is we're going to just give you something that's basic that you can tailor for your organization that gives you these principles that we just spoke about. So it's a very simple policy. Of course, we're not saying this is what you have to use, but we wanted to provide you something that you could take away from today to start on the path of getting to where you need to go with the uh, disclosure for treatment providers and, and really um, showing that you are intending to um, comply with the rule that's being implemented and, and, and enforced very soon. Great. Okay, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about sharing with non-medical providers um, and make sure that we all understand that there are, there are differences between sharing information for treatment purposes with medical providers and sharing information for treatment purposes with third party or non-medical providers. And in fact, um, up until recently, most of us weren't even certain that OCR would permit this kind of sharing with third parties. Uh, and we got some really good information from them in the notice of proposed rulemaking that came out in December. And we're gonna walk through some of that and hopefully give you a better idea of how you can share with social service agencies and community-based organizations 
without needing a patient's authorization and what that looks like. So it's best to start with the existing definition under HIPAA. And as I said at the outset, there's been no change to the definition of treatment uh, under HIPAA. And the treatment definition is longer than what's here on the screen. Uh, but I want to focus on what's in bold. But as the definition says, treatment means the provision, coordination, or management of healthcare and related services by one or more healthcare providers, including the coordination or management of a health of healthcare by a healthcare provider with a third party. And what we've all had little guidance on over the last several years is what does that mean with a third party? But now we've got some clarification from OCR that helps us understand exactly what they meant. So in the notice of proposed rulemaking that came out in December and was finally published in the Federal Register sometime at the, was it the end of January or, or in February, it was recent that it was ultimately published. Um, what was that, Cheryl? 121. Oh, thank you, January 21st. Um, the, the notice of proposed rulemaking which spanned like 300 pages in its initial form um, and had proposed changes to HIPAA and commentary, dedicated an entire section of nearly 10 pages to this, this very clarification of how you can share certain protected health information with third parties. So I gave you the page numbers from the notice of proposed rulemaking to the extent that you're interested. It's not a long section, but it, there's really a lot going on there. The first thing that OCR tells us is that healthcare, as used in the treatment definition, means care, services, or supplies related to the health of an individual. And they also give us an example of uh, food or shelter that's needed to avoid health risks as falling into this definition of healthcare. Uh, they further, they give us some clarification on what kinds of third parties are contemplated under that definition that we just read. And OCR said a third party includes any organization that's part of the broader treatment plan or is participating in the coordination of care of that individual. And it's very clear that that organization does not need to be a medical provider. And so we now have that in black and white from, from OCR, but they do then go into some additional limitations on sharing information with these third party organizations. And what's really critically important is that minimum necessary applies to disclosures to these third parties, to social service agencies, to community-based organizations. And you all know that under traditional treatment disclosures, minimum necessary doesn't apply. Uh, so, here, OCR is giving us some really important information. That means that if you're making a disclosure, you know, for example, to a transportation provider, right, who is providing transportation to a patient, it's related to their health care. It means that disclosures made to that transportation organization need to be limited to the least amount of protected health information possible for that provider to provide that service. So a transportation provider may need to know about a patient's mobility limitations, but they likely don't need to know about a patient's prostate cancer or some other condition. So this is a really important thing to remember if you're going to be doing disclosures to social service agencies, community-based organizations under this clarification is that minimum necessary does apply. One other important note that came out of uh, OCR's clarification is they said that one of the primary reasons for allowing these disclosures without a written authorization from the patient is because the patient would expect the disclosure under these circumstances. They would expect that if something was recommended as part of their treatment plan, that they'd expect the communication with, um, with the third party. And OCR did us a, a little bit of a favor and they gave us a few examples that are helpful. Um, they provide some examples uh, with a senior, senior center or adult day center. And they point to assisting a patient with post-discharge protocols and to provide disease self-management reminders. Now, OCR didn't give us much more detail than that, but you can imagine from those examples, things like coordinating uh, meal delivery for a diabetic to make sure that um, the meal delivery service 
knows about dietary restrictions or reminders for midday medications if someone is at an adult day center all day or reminders about um, the need to move or reposition or the need to limit movement because there's been a recent injury. Those sorts of things we can imagine um, in a senior center or an adult day center sort of setting. The other example that OCR gave us was um, providing mental health information to a supportive housing organization or an income assistance or job training organization. Uh, and that it's okay to share under the circumstances where those organizations can help that individual get the kind of services they need. There is of course one important caveat to that, which we've already touched on a little and we're gonna talk in a little more detail about, and that is when it comes to mental health or substance use disorder information. To the extent that state laws have more strict requirements for privacy around mental health information or substance use disorder information, those state requirements are still going to apply. So if a state law requires written consent, you can't share with those third party organizations without meeting that state law requirement. So for example, I'm in Connecticut. And in Connecticut, there is a state statute that restricts the sharing of mental health information without explicit written consent from the patient. And so OCR's new clarification that you can share with third parties um, does not do away with a state's requirement that you must have the written consent from the patient. So be careful with the kinds of information you're dealing with and ask the question, are there other laws or rules that apply? We've already talked for a moment about 42 CFR part two, but it's worth talking about here. Um, again, this is, these are the regulations that apply to substance use disorder treatment information, which is uh, really highly protected under these rules. Now there were some changes under the CARES Act this last year regarding sharing for treatment purposes, but those changes didn't eliminate the need for prior written consent from the patient for sharing for treatment purposes. And so nothing we're talking about here today in OCR's clarification allows you to share substance use disorder treatment information without that written consent. Once you've got the prior written consent, you can then use, you can then disclose information as HIPAA permits. So let's say for example, a part two provider um, at the time of intake gets permission from a patient to share information with an assisting, an assistive housing provider for once they're discharged. Upon discharge, they can go ahead and share information with that housing provider, provided that it's still necessary for part of the part of the treatment plan. But you would need that uh, written consent. And Dina, before yeah. you move on, I think it's good for us to remember too in the notice of proposed rulemaking that OCR made clear that the rulemaking in December was not going to address the CARES Act changes and that they were generating additional proposed rules that we will see this year likely on implementing all of those changes related to the exchange of information for treatment, payment, and operations under part two. So look ahead for that. Yeah, that's a great reminder, Erin. And it'll be interesting to see what those rules, uh, what those rules ultimately look like uh, and, and whether there'll be any changes to HIPAA in addition to the changes to the 42 CFR rules, because as you all know, they don't really match up all that well um, right now. So talking about um, talking about sharing with third parties, let's talk about some best practices. And the best practices really are sort of common sense based. You really want to discuss the health related service with the patient and have a conversation with the patient about why you're, the provider is recommending a particular kind of service and how it supports the treatment goals. And then you can share information that's necessary with the third party to access those services um, and document that interaction, unless the patient rejects the recommended service or the patient communicates to you that they'd rather contact uh, that service provider themselves. And so 
it's important to recognize when a patient says, you know what, I'm not interested in that kind of service. Uh, I think there are a couple of reasons why that would be problematic to go ahead and provide the referral anyway. First, OCR made clear in its clarification, clear in its clarification, that, um, that one of the reasons they're allowing this is because the patient expects the disclosure. If the patient said to you they're not interested, then they certainly don't expect that disclosure. And you know, while technically speaking under the right to, to request a restriction under HIPAA, for treatment purposes, it really depends on whether the provider is going to allow that restriction or not. I, I, would, I would suggest to you that if you go ahead and make a disclosure to a third party provider that the patient told you not to, uh, you're certainly going to damage that treatment relationship. The patient may not come back, may not be honest with you in, in the future. And so there are a number of reasons not to, um, to provide that referral to a third party when the patient says that they're not interested. And I want to pause here and bring Cheryl into the conversation because Cheryl's got a lot of good um, experience and background. And Cheryl, what insights do you have on best practices? Oh, you may be on mute, Cheryl. Oh, I had such a good point when I was muted. Anyway. <laughs> Um, the only thing I really want to add to what you were saying, Dina, is as, as along with losing the patient or, or having them become irate, there is also the possibility if you, do some, if you do send off a referral to a third party and the patient didn't want you to, and the third party then calls them and they get belittled or attacked by that patient who is now irate, you're, you're possibly um, affecting the, the relationship that you have with that third party service provider that you've been, you've spent years trying to get um, going and comfortable. And so you don't wanna to force anything on anybody and you don't wanna have that third party um, service provider feel rejected either. Great point, Cheryl. So, uh, so, and Cheryl, we have a really good question. Go oh, ahead. go ahead. So uh, from Michael, uh, hi, Michael, how are you? I love your posts on LinkedIn. Keep them coming. They're great. Uh, he says, does a non-covered entity who receives data have any obligation under HIPAA to safeguard the data? And, and this is interesting because in the notice of proposed rulemaking, OCR clearly states we know that we don't have obligation or we don't have the ability to um, fine or, or, or otherwise control these, a lot of these third parties who are not covered entities. So there's this recognition that, and, and, and of course it's the reason for the minimum necessary Absolutely. rule in these circumstances, Dina. I mean, we've talked about that. It, it is the reason that we provide the minimum necessary to accomplish the treatment related purpose goal is because we know OCR doesn't reach that far. Of course, a lot of our state laws do. And a lot of our state laws go beyond just covered entities. And they say every person who obtains information that is uh, health information and it's private and confidential can be prosecuted criminally, in some cases civilly, for inappropriately disclosing that information. But as to HIPAA and OCR, you're absolutely right, Michael, there is no recourse there. And to Aaron's point, it's precisely why, and OCR says this in the notice of proposed rulemaking, that's why minimum necessary applies here. And it also shows us their commitment to the overall concept of coordination of care. And it's almost like they're saying it's a risk we're willing to take, right? They're saying that that's why we're gonna provide as little information as possible to get them the access to the service with the understanding that this third party may not be subject to HIPAA because they're not a covered entity or they're not a business associate, uh, but there is definitely that recognition that, um, that they're not covered by that. So thanks for asking that question, really, really great point. Um, so I have some more questions if you'd like to hear them. They've been anytime, speaking. sure. Sure, thanks. Um, I'd like to alert a CBO when patients go to the ER so an advocate or peer counselor can meet them usually with the patient's prior knowledge, but perhaps not always. Is this possible? Can you define the acronyms for me? CBO. Could somebody unmute and tell us what that is? Central Business Office. 
Oh, thank you. So the, que the question again, uh, Cheryl? Yeah, I'd like to alert a central business office when patients go to the ER so an advocate or peer counselor can meet them, usually with the patient's prior knowledge, but perhaps not always. Is this possible? And Dina, um, Jay Gate says it means in this particular case, community-based organization. Oh, so this is like reversed information sharing. So the community-based organization is then sharing. Yes. I think this is actually going to, I'm sending a patient to, to this other treatment provider. I want the community-based organization to be able to, to support them. Can I essentially tell them, you know, provide protected health information um, in order for that community-based organization representative to be there as a support person. And this, I think, Dina, goes straight to this consent piece that you were talking about. Yeah. And, and first and foremost, the, the first question is, is it related to the treatment plan for the patient? So the, the covered entity that's responsible for the information, in order for them to make that disclosure, number one, it's got to be related to the, the treatment plan. Number two, it's got to be to an organization that can help provide a support or service. And number three, it's if the patient is not, um, if the patient doesn't object, then you can share the limited amount of information that's necessary. And again, if we're talking about mental health or substance use disorder, there are going to be other rules that apply. So I think we needed a little more information to, um, to get through um, that one. And I think also we need to remember that we have to be very careful about providing information to a service that you think might be helpful, but that the patient doesn't know right. is showing up. So I know that there are partnerships that happen in the community with a healthcare provider and with other social service agencies. What we need to do is not have sort of a rote process where we're constantly sending information about patients to that organization without the patient knowing we're doing it. So although it's allowed for, for this case management and care coordination, coordination piece, it's very important that we involve the patient or the patient's personal representative in making sure that they want it part of the treatment process. Yeah. And remember what I said earlier about in the clarification, OCR said one of the reasons you can do this without the written authorization is because the patient expects it. Once you remove that expectation, you know, it, you lose the argument for having um, the ability to share that information. It's also important to note that this is all based on OCR's clarification. None of this is in the regulation. Right. OCR is sort of winging it on some level to broaden the sharing that's allowed for treatment purposes. So they're trying to increase sharing for coordination of care. And so they're sort of winging it a little. So um, I would say that you, you, the test has to be, is the patient expecting you to share that information? If they're expecting it, it's part of the treatment plan and it's with a provider that can provide that service then you can share the limited amount that's necessary to get access to that service. So, so I, have what a, we, oh. I have a lot of questions coming in. Um, where are we at? Do you wanna save the others for the end or do you want me to- Let's, do, let's do two things. Um, first, the sample policy is self-explanatory. We've gone through the, the best practices. There are two slides with examples. I think they're really important okay. for us to get to. Um, so let's do, I'll do the example slide here and then Aaron and I together are gonna do the COVID-19 related examples. And then um, we'll try to do this quickly so we can get to, um, to the additional questions. So this is on third party um, disclosures. Assume that the provider recommends a homeless shelter to a patient who lives in their car because lack of rest is exacerbating an underlying a condition. Assume that the patient agrees. What are you sharing with the homeless shelter? You're certainly not sharing tons of detail on the patient's underlying conditions. In fact, it likely is limited to, I have a patient with a chronic underlying condition that requires more rest and they're living in their car. I can't imagine you would need to or would be able to share anything else. Now, if the patient rec rec rejects that recommendation, as we've said, there's no expectation that that's going to be shared and you really shouldn't share it. Um, the other example is if a provider offers to coordinate meal delivery service with a local agency, um, 
and to make that agency aware of the patient's dietary needs. The patient agrees that this is a good idea, but wants to contact the agency themselves. Again, this comes back to expectations. So we're gonna leave these examples. I wanna dive into the other examples with Aaron because there's some real meat here. And I think folks will find it useful. And Aaron, maybe we can try to wrap this up in like three or four minutes and then have the rest of the time for, for the questions. Perfect. Um, so I think I'll take the first one and then turn it over to, um, to Aaron or, or we can go back and forth. Consider a situation where a provider referred a patient to a podiatrist and the podiatrist requests proof of a negative COVID-19 test prior to the visit. I think it's pretty clear that that's going to fit within the treatment except within the, the treatment disclosures and would be, um, would be permitted. The next is not as clear. Uh, in fact, it's, it's also clear, but it's clear in the other way. A homeless shelter requests a COVID-19 test result out of concern for others in the shelter. Concern for others in the shelter is not for treatment purposes. And so while it may sound like it's a good idea, um, it certainly doesn't fit in this treatment bucket. Uh, Aaron, do you have anything you want to weigh in on that? Right. Yeah. And, and really it goes back to, um, is part of your treatment trying to get this person housing? And then what is the purpose under the treatment for you providing the information? And so, um, in this particular case, Dan, I think, you know, practically speaking, what you have to do is go back to the patient and say, they're requesting this information and your safest bet on this particular scenario is getting an authorization because it doesn't relate to the treatment purposes necessarily. Um, and the person's health. So, I mean, if it was like, is the person healthy enough to, to go to the homeless shelter, that's one thing it, and, and not related to the health of others in the shelter. So that I like this question because it really does show there's some gray area and we really need to focus on the purpose and the minimum necessary for the treatment. Um, and, uh, and then do you want me to jump into the next? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. So, so we, we see this a lot, um, local church, church-based companies that want to help with you know, discharge services or medication services, or, and again, here we've got COVID-19 related information um, being requested. What, uh, what are we sharing with them and what is the purpose? So again, um, request COVID-19 results or vaccinated vaccination um, confirmation. So again, this sort of gets it's back to what we were talking about with the homeless shelter. What is the service that the church-based company is providing? Um, and does the, comp does the church-based service need to have that information in order to provide the treatment-related services? And then what is the minimum necessary needed? So if we continue with that process, we need to ask those questions when this information is requested. So it's really about having a policy that we ask the question of why the information is needed or we, and we note it in our documentation when we do provide it. So we can show that it's a treatment related service and the information disclosed was the minimum necessary in order for the person to receive the treatment. So uh, dietary restri restrictions are perfect. You know, if you're bringing meals to somebody, you do need dietary restrictions. If somebody has dietary restrictions for their treatment goal to reach their treatment goal, you know, somebody who has um, um, diabetes would be a perfect example of why you would might um, provide that information. And also um, in, the incision treatment instructions are a great example of if somebody has surgery and you've got a, a person as, in, assisting with when to change, uh, uh, you know, dressings and that sort of thing, that is information that might be needed. Um, but if somebody is providing meals um, and they need to know nothing about incision treatment instructions, then it wouldn't fit. So hopefully that was a, a short enough um, discussion on that. But really the same analysis, the same documentation made, the same questions asked in order to get to the answer on all of these questions. Great. And so I can quickly answer one of the questions that I just saw. How does HIPAA apply to an employer that requires COVID-19 test results to return to work? HIPAA does not apply to employer-employee relationships. Right. Um, and I'm not seeing, Cheryl, can we let you take over with other questions? Because I'm there's, not seeing. 
There's one uh, regarding a patient um, opting into information sharing broadly by agreeing um, to be part of a care coordination program and being a user of a cloud-based whole person care process. Some of this is covered by CMS's API related um, rules that we're seeing implemented. So uh, what we're gonna see is we're gonna see if, if, if uh, you know, patients start opting into APIs um, and we're going to start seeing those APIs hook up to uh, uh, the, your medical record. Some of this information may be shared through that process. Regarding requests from, uh, you know, just verbal requests, I don't know how that would work, but we'd have to know information, more information about the cloud-based service to really get into that. But we're going to start seeing the sharing happening much more on an electronic basis, but that's not going to likely relate to this care coordination case management piece that we're talking about today. And just to get back to the basics of sharing generally, it's the patient's information. They can share it any way they want. So right. if they authorize any level of sharing, whether it's, you know, to to some app that's not protected by HIPAA or through a cloud-based whole person care center process. That's entirely up to them and it's certainly permitted. Right. Were there other questions, Cheryl, that you were hanging on to? I'm scrolling through, but don't know what we've covered. And there's one question about uh, oh, payers requesting oh. medical records as part of a reimbursement if they fall under the information blocking rules. I, I agree with your statement. Um, it, it's not necessarily related for treatment purposes, but it may be if it relates to care coordination and case management. And the notice of proposed rulemaking actually spoke about that. And of course, the proposed rules do talk about more sharing that likely will be allowed in the future between providers and health insurers who are conducting joint care coordination and case management. So we do want to look for that in the future. And there are spaces where the notice of proposed rulemaking said it can happen now. So if you want more information on that, I would go to that December 12th uh, rule. Uh, looks like somebody was clarifying the HIPAA, the employer employee question. They okay. mean meant directly from the testing center, not directly from the employee. You can only get, as the employer, you can only get information directly from the testing center if the employee gives you consent. An employer is not a service, a social service agency or a community-based organization that's related to treatment. So that this wouldn't be a circumstance under which you could do that. There would be an authorization required in those circumstances. It doesn't fit any of the exceptions. Um, do you still need the signed consent form for a patient to request records from another healthcare provider? The answer is you've never needed a signed request form to get patient, to get records from, well, let me, there's a caveat to that because HIPAA has previously said it's, it's permissible for one treating provider to send records to another treating provider without a signed authorization. And we know that many treating providers are requiring signed authorizations just out of habit. Um, and so, you don't have to have a signed consent form. And after April 5th, if they have a signed consent requirement, that would be deemed to be information blocking to the extent that they were seeking electronic um, health information. Erin, I don't know if you want to clarify that or not. Right. No, that was very good. I think we talked about that earlier. So you might want to go back to this recording because we did talk about that earlier when it comes to um, those some of those details. Uh, Eileen just put, do you need a release of the um, release if the employer is the payer? What we need to remember, of course, compliance professionals are all over this. An employer for employment related matters is a different area of an employer for who is the insurer. There are two separate areas of that employer's operations. And if there is an insured side that is requesting the information for insurance and payment purposes, that is different than utilizing that information for employment related topics, such as can we return them to work? So they're going to have to keep those, those pieces distinct. But if an employer comes to you and they're not telling you whether they're the insurer or the employer, you're going to clarify that information if they're coming to you because it's an insurance plan of the employer that's trying to, you know, 
pay for this testing or vaccination services, you're cons- you need to consider that you're talking to a covered entity that's an insurer and deal with it in that way. So you really want to get clarity on whether the employer is acting as the employer for employment purposes or the insurer for insurance purposes and payment purposes. That's the clarity that you'll need to know that you need to obtain if that is the issue, Eileen, you're looking at on on requests for information. uh, Cheryl, did we miss anything? I know it's two minutes out. Yeah, but I've got them copied. So I'm thinking that we can respond to them and then send them out to the, when we send out the recording. All right, very good. Well, the slide with our contact information is up and you'll also get copies of the slides. Thanks again to everyone for participating and and Aaron and Cheryl and I are real happy to do this. So thanks for being here with us. Um, Our friends at Hippotrek, is there anything else we need to do before we sign off? Thank you ladies so much, Aaron and Dina. And if anybody needs any information on how Compliance Stride or DMC Law can help you manage your compliance, please feel free to contact Aaron or Dina. You can also reach out to your HIPAA-TREC representative. We are more than happy to put you in touch with one of these amazing ladies. Also, if you are not currently a HIPAA-TREC client and would like to know more about our software to help you manage your compliance, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Dina. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, everybody, for great questions. Have a great one. Bye. Bye.